Welcome to an Illinois Family Institute Soldiers of the Cross presentation. Our speaker is retired Lieutenant General Jerry Boykin. The former Delta Force commander led elite warriors in combat operations. He later commanded the Army's Green Berets. His career in the Army spanned 36 years, serving his last four years as a Deputy Undersecretary of Defense for Intelligence. General Boykin is an ordained minister who spreads the gospel of Jesus Christ. And he's the executive vice president of the Family Research Council. General Boykin's comments were recorded at Revive Church in Collinsville. Our thanks to Pastor Miles Holmes for allowing IFI to hold a Soldiers of the Cross forum there. All right, now here's what I've got to do. I know we've got some veterans in here, and, and, and it became kind of obvious to me that we got at least one Marine in here. Where's that Marine? I know we got West Modern was a Marine. Where's the Marine? Okay, we got a Marine here. We got a Marine here. That's a problem when I got this many Marines because I actually had some big words in my presentation here today. <laughs> So this Marine walked into Walmart, he had on his best blues, oh he was looking good, he walked up to, the, to a clerk there and he said, pardon me, I want to buy that TV right there. The clerk said, I will not sell that to a Marine. He said, oh, he got huffy, he went home, he, was, he stewed on a little while and he thought, well I really want that TV. So he, put on his civilian clothes, put his ball cap on, went in, walked back up to the clerk and said, uh, excuse me, sir, I want to buy that TV right there. And the clerk said, I will not sell that to a Marine. Oh, that really upset him. He went home, it was Friday night, he slept on it all night. He got up the next day and he said, well, maybe there's a different clerk in there today. Put on his civilian clothes, pull his cap down, Walked in and there was a woman in there and he walked up to her and he said, ma'am, I want to buy that TV right there. She said, I will not sell that to a Marine. He said, well, first of all, how do you even know that I'm a Marine? And the lady said, because that's actually a microwave. <laughs> well done, Wes. Good job, and yes, uh, that was a very painful period, uh, and I have been through that kind of thing, if you know anything about me, and you really do, you pray some bizarre prayers like, God, do you know what you're doing? Have you just left me? Have you abandoned me? Does that sound familiar, Wes? Well, I think when we look back, we see exactly what God did with our lives. You know, I, uh, I supported uh, Ted Cruz for the election of 2016. I campaigned with Ted Cruz. I went around, I traveled with him, campaigned with him. Tony Perkins, the president of Family Research Council, we campaigned with Ted Cruz. We were all in for Ted. We started out with Ben Carson and Ben was fading fast, so we, we went over to Ted and I got angry with some of my Christian friends because they were supporting Donald Trump. And I called them up and I said, in fact, the ministry that ordained me, Morning Star Ministries out of Fort Mill, South Carolina, I actually called the head of Morning Star Ministries, Rick Joyner, and I said, what are you doing? What am I missing? I'm supporting a Christian. What am I missing? He said, uh, brother, he said, I've been praying about this thing and this is what the Lord has laid on my heart. That the next president's gonna be Donald Trump. I got angry with him. I got angry with him and Lance Wall now uh, and others. I got nasty with him. Well, I want you to go back to a World War II. Now, think about this for a minute. There was a guy in Britain a little round fat man that smoked cigars and drank scotch. And he told the British people, he said, he said, uh, Hitler's a menace. Hitler's an evil man. Hitler's going to try to take over not only this continent, but he's going to come and take over Britain and he's going to take over the whole world if we don't stop him. 
And, they, and Neville Chamberlain, who was at that time the Prime Minister, came out and said, peace in our times, peace in our times. And, and uh, so they said, tell the little fat man to go away. We don't want to hear what he has to say. But in 1939, when Hitler, in 1939, when Hitler actually invaded Poland, everybody said, oh my goodness, where's the little fat man? He's, yeah. Yeah. he's, actually, he's actually right. Amen. And they brought him back, but they brought him back in May, on May 10th of 1940. And they brought him back with opposition within his own party. He was not popular. They didn't really like his message, but they knew that he was right. They didn't like him, but they brought him back. And then they had, and you may have seen the movie, then they had this evacuation off the beaches of Dunkirk just days after he took over as the prime minister. And the British people had decided, well, let's cut a deal with Hitler. Let's cut a deal that says, if you want to invade our little island, we want interfere with what you're doing on the mainland of Europe. The British people wanted to capitulate. And on the 4th of June, right after that evacuation out of Dunkirk, Winston Churchill had the opportunity to speak to the British people and he had one chance to convince them not to capitulate. And he gave what became his most powerful speech. And here's what he said in the end as he came to the end of this speech in the House of Commons. He finished his speech by saying this. We shall go on to the end. We shall fight in France. We shall fight on the seas and the oceans. We shall fight with growing confidence and growing strength in the air. We shall defend our island whatever the cost may be. We shall fight on the beaches. We shall fight on the landing grounds. We shall fight in the fields and in the streets. We shall fight in the hills. And we shall never surrender. Winston Churchill saved Western civilization. You realize that? He saved Western democracy. But you know something? He never would have passed the test as an evangelical. That's right. 20 cigars a day, a bottle of scotch a day. He used colorful language. He never gave any indication that he prayed, but if you go back and look in history, he was an incredibly prophetic man. See, God used an ass one time to speak to His people, didn't He? Amen. Now, I know some of you are looking at me saying, now nah, He's doing it again. <laughs> I was limiting God. I was limiting God. See, God raised Winston Churchill up for such a time as That's that. Right. He has now given us a chance with Donald Trump. You That's see, right. we have greater access to the White House under Donald Trump than we ever had under George W. Bush and certainly under Barack Obama. Amen. We have better access to the White House now. How many people, how many pre presidents have you ever seen with a photograph of them on the internet with evangelical pastors laying their hands on them and praying for them in the Oval Office? You ever seen that before? No. You know, in... Uh, 1993, I was commanding the Delta Force in a place called Mogadishu, Somalia. You know it as Black Hawk Down. Yes. You know, we lost uh, 16 Americans there on the 3rd of October, 1993, as we got into a clash with the militia of the notorious warlord named Mohammed Faria Deed. 16 of my men were killed. The man right next to me was killed. I was wounded. I went down, we were hitting a mortar blast. I went down and when I got up, I looked down and I saw that my, my master sergeant was dead. As I looked at him and I realized that it could have been me, I said to the Lord, I said, why him? 
and not me? Why'd you take him and not me? I have, my children are grown. He, he has small children. Why'd you take him and not me? Why? Why, Lord? I came home with that question burning in my mind. Why did you take him and not me? Lord, I'm ready to go. I don't know about him. And uh, I came home and I never talked to my pastor about it. I, I never talked to my wife about it. I never talked to my friends about it. It was a question between me and the Lord. Why did you take him, Lord, and not me? It's called survivor's guilt. Now they got a name for everything, you know, but, but for me it was a spiritual question. Why, Lord, did you take him and not me? After I retired from the Army in 2007, I left Washington and went about three hours south to a little place called Farmville, Virginia, and that's just what it sounds like is what it is. It's a little farming community. And I uh, looked in the rearview mirror as I was driving out of Washington and I saw the Pentagon and I said, thank you, Lord, that I don't have to come back to this city anymore. <laughs> 2012, Tony Perkins called me and said, man, I need you to come up here and be my executive vice president. And I, Tony, I'll do what I can for you, but I am not coming back to Washington. And uh, he called me three times, and each time I said, I have told you already, what part of no are you having trouble with? I know you're a Marine, but, <laughs> but no is only two letters. And he said, man, I need you to come back. So he asked my wife and me to go to dinner with him. One night we went to dinner, and we sat down, and he leaned across the table, and he said, Ashley, what do you think the Lord wants him to do? <laughs> okay, so we came back to Washington. <laughs> but I was still asking that question. Why would you take him, Lord, and not me? I'd been at, at Family Research Council for about three weeks. On the 15th of August, 2012, I was sitting in my office and I heard shots. And being an old soldier, I got up and ran to the sound of the gunfire. It was down in our lobby. When we got down into the lobby, our building manager was standing there with a bullet hole in his arm with his foot on the neck of a man. Our building manager a big guy. And he was standing there with his foot on the neck of a man that had come in our building and shot him and shot two more rounds. When you come to a family research council. We'll show you the bullet holes in the, in the lobby there where this occurred. We didn't fill them up. We wanted them as a reminder. And this man was a member of a local LGBT center. He was a LGBT activist. And he came in our building and he told the judge he came in our building to kill as many of us as possible because we didn't support same-sex marriage. And we had been very open about the fact that we supported marriage as being a relationship between one man and one woman. Or as my brother's badge here says, one mom and one dad is what marriage is. So he came in to kill us because of our position, our stance on marriage. But as I stood there looking, and, and the man's pistol was laying right in front of him, and I was, I was thinking, should I shoot him? And just about the time I was ready to reach down and pick up the pistol, the police came rushing in. They were literally across the street. But as I stood over this, the Lord spoke to me. And the Lord said, this is why I spared you. I spared you to fight another day. But I spared you to fight this battle. I prepared you with 36 and a half years in the military, but I spared you to fight this battle. Folks, we're in a battle. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. We're in a battle, and I believe that we have a reprieve right now. Yes. We have four years to turn this culture, to make a difference. You can't roll back eight years in just a, a year. That's right. But you can start the process, and you can start rolling things back and restoring our godly heritage and a reminder that 
We were created as a nation of believers. We were created by 56 men that signed that Declaration of Independence. They were all of the Christian faith. They didn't agree on theology. I doubt if we could agree on theology right here. But we were created to be a Christian nation. And the church, the Black Robe Regiment brought about the American Revolution and the churches in America. The pastors in America brought about the Civil War which brought an end to the evils of slavery. Amen. It was the church. And now is the time for the church to rise up. And the church rises up only when the pastors rise up. That's right. You know, uh, Jeremiah 5150, if you read Jeremiah 5150 in the English Standard Version, you got to read it in ESV. I found this one time. ESV. It says, it says that the Lord has spared us from the sword. It says, you've been spared from the sword. Now go. Do not stand still. Go. What does it mean, go? It means go where the Lord sends you. Go where the Lord sends you. Rome, you know, what, what, you know what's happened to America? We've done exactly what the Bible tells us not to do. In Romans 12, 2. What does it say? What, is it, what did the Lord tell us not to do? Be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind. And what has happened to us? We have transformed. We've conformed to this world. And you know, when you've got people that are well-known evangelical pastors that are getting up and saying, we're all going to heaven. Then why do we need church? Why do we have church? We're all going to heaven. Some of you know who I'm talking about. Amen. In fact, I just saw where that guy came out with a new one just last week that said the Bible has been so destructive. Did any of you see that besides me? But this guy came out with a, he said, the Bible has been so destructive. If Jesus were here today, he would not approve of organized religion. Well, hey, brother, I got news for you. Jesus is here today. Amen. Amen. He is here today. God, be not conformed. We've taken the easy way, and that's the problem. And then we've got these pastors. We've got a, a son of a very well known pastor that, in fact, he himself pastors a huge church, and he came out of about four years ago with this thing that my dad's been wrong for 40 years about marriage. God has revealed to me, you know what? The arrogance of some of these whistle britches pastors, that say, and that's a Southern term for you guys in Illinois, but it means a slick willy or something like that. That God has revealed to me We've got this all wrong about marriage. Oh, God has revealed to me that we got this all wrong about the transgenders and the arrogance of thinking that God's waited 2,000 years to finally choose you to reveal the truth. Well, you know what He's revealed to me? He's revealed to me that number one, you're a false prophet. Number two, you're a coward. Because you're conforming to this world rather than standing on gospel truth. Which is exactly what you're talking about, Wes. Standing on the truth as it is in the scriptures. And we've got an awful lot of people that are conforming to this world. You know old Jack Phillips. Anybody even know who Jack Phillips is? Similar case to what happened to Wes. He, he refused to, to make a cake for a, a same-sex marriage out in Colorado. And his case is now before the Supreme Court. He's sort of like Aaron and Melissa Klein out in Oregon, who same thing. And then you got the photographer, and you got the florist, and you got all kinds of people that have said, "No, I, I, I can't do this. I, this violates my conscience." How many of you ever heard of Kim Davis? Yes. Yep. Huh? Let me tell you what we've got to have today is we got to have courage. Right now, we either believe the Bible or we don't. We either, we either believe God's Word or we don't. When He says, I'll never leave you nor forsake you. He didn't say, I won't let you suffer a little bit. He didn't say there won't be pain. In fact, that's what He endured at the cross. In fact, the, the disciples were martyred. That's right. Kim Davis. 
clerk in the Kentucky court that said, no, I can't sign a same-sex marriage license. And they said, well, then you're going to jail. The night before she, her hearing before a judge, she got down on her knees. And I want you to know that this woman has lived a rough life. When this happened to her, she'd only been saved. She'd only been redeemed by God's glory. Four years. But prior to that, she had a couple of husbands and uh, quite a few paramours. And for you Marines, that's lovers. Okay? <laughs> you understood because you're Army. Yeah, you understood. <laughs> But she had lived a rough life. But let me tell you, when the Lord saved her, this was a radical conversion. Yeah. I mean, she, this woman was on fire for the Lord. And she got down on her knees and prayed. And she said, she said, Lord, what do you want me to do? And the Lord said to her, said, I'm going to put you in jail. But don't worry about it. I'm going to let you out and it's going to serve my purpose. Well, the next day, the judge said, Miss Davis. Are you going to sign these same-sex marriage license or not? And she said, no, judge, it violates my faith. He said, then I'm remanding you over to the county jail for a period of whatever it was. I don't know. You know what she did? She didn't break down and start weeping. She raised her hands and said, thank you, Lord. Because he was doing exactly what he told her. Yeah. She, he said, bailiff cuffer. Big old bailiff. Standing there shaking, <laughs> weeping. He didn't want to put the cuffs on her. They got her over to the fingerprinter and the two ladies there at the fingerprint station were weeping. She said, no, honey, no, you got to meet this woman. Have you met her, Tim? Yeah. Yep. You got to meet this woman. Wes, you've met her. When you come close to her, you feel the presence of the Lord. You want some of what, every time I see her, I say, come here, I need one of them hugs. I want some of what you got. She said to the ladies, now come on, hon, put your hand right here on mine. You know what you're doing here. Put. She did her own fingerprints. And then Tony Perkins and Mike Huckabee and, and uh, Matt Staver from Liberty Council all descended on that Kentucky jail. And they brought the media with them. And they started saying, this is not right. This is, violates her constitutional rights. And we're going to rally Christians all over this country for... Well, they finally came in and said, Miss Davis said, we're going to let you out. She said, let me see the papers. They said, well, we, well we're going to let you out, Miss Davis. No, let me see the papers. They showed them to her. She said, this does not give me an accommodation. I'm not leaving. Miss mm -hmm. Davis, you've got to go. No, I'm not leaving this jail. Until you have something that says, I have an accommodation. All right. They finally came back with that accommodation. You know what? That woman had only been saved for four years. Is that an example of what every one of us ought to be? Not, we're not conforming to this world. We're standing on our faith. We're standing because we believe the Word of God. And no matter what the consequences are, we're going to stand. And that's what we need to be telling the people in our churches today. You have to stand. You can't conform to this world. You've got to stand. Because God's Word doesn't change just because it's inconvenient for you to believe it. And that's what's happening. We've got to have people with courage. And we've got to stop calling good evil and evil good. And we've got to be warriors in God's kingdom got to get out of our comfort zone. And you know, there was a saying that came out of World War II and it said this. Think about this for a second because this is a message for the church. The soldier does not fight because he hates the enemy in front of him. He fights because he loves what's behind him. Amen. Right? Amen. We fight as Christians in God's kingdom because we love what's behind us. Amen. And that's our family. That's our country. That's our faith. we got to be like old Chesty Poor, and I'm going to throw you Marines a bone here. <laughs> Chesty Puller was the most famous and highly decorated Marine in the history of the United States Marine Corps. And in 1950, December 1950, he got surrounded up at the Chosun Reservoir in North Korea. 
worst winter they had had on record. 9,500 Marines and Chesty Puller was surrounded by 300,000 Chinese and North Koreans. He calls his headquarters. He says, all right, they're on the left. They're on the right. And I uh, see a bunch of them out in front of me. And I know they're behind me. They won't get away this time. <laughs> Think about that. Wow. I am surrounded. And now I'm going to take a toll on the enemy. That's, I'm going to kill me some Goliaths. I mean, stop and think about it, though. Uh, we've got to have that kind of courage. We've got to have that kind of attitude. We've got to be willing to stand. And uh, I could go on, but I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to bring this to a conclusion by telling you that uh, I have seen a lot of miracles in my time. And for those of you who have never heard me speak at a church service or a men's event, I tell a story, but I tell it with a purpose. And that is, I started out by telling you when I was wounded in Mogadishu, which was not the first time I'd been wounded, but I when I finally got back up on my feet, I'd been hitting the legs with this mortar. I started, I started saying, somebody find the doctor. Somebody find the doctor. And he was laying right next to me. I didn't know it, but he had walked up and he, when the mortar went off, it hit him right in the growing here and it hit him in the femoral artery and he went down and he was laying there in a pool of blood. He was bleeding out. And you, you're a medic, you're a corpsman. You know, a serious injury. They picked me and him up on uh, stretchers and laid us side by side in a little tent that the Air Force had set up there with a unit. And, and they, uh, I reached over and he was laying next to me and he was, his eyes were closed and I reached over and took his hand and I squeezed his hand. And I said, Rob, hold on, brother. You're gonna make it. And I began to pray and I began to say, Lord, save this man, don't let him die. And they put a blood pressure machine on him and they put a, a heart monitor on him and it was an old vertical type and I could, I could see his heart rate dropping, I could see his, his uh, blood pressure dropping and they were working feverishly trying to save him. Working on that girl and they, they finally just ripped him right open to get in there and pinch off that artery. And uh, I was laying there squeezing his hand saying, Rob, hold on now, brother, hold on. You're going to make it. Hold on, brother. God, don't let him die. And all of a sudden, uh, the nurse, the Air Force Major said, sir, he's gone. She put her hand down on my shoulder. She said, sir, he's gone. I looked over at the blood pressure machine and the heart monitor and he, and he was gone. But I wouldn't accept it. I said, Lord, in Jesus' name, in Jesus' name, I'm asking you not to let him die. And just prior to him, to them declaring him dead, he opened his eyes and he looked at me as I was holding his hand. And he said, tell Barbara I love her. Barbara was his wife. And that was it. He was gone. I said, Lord, I'm not, I'm not accepting that he's dead because you are the author and the creator of life. And I'm asking you to spare this man. And then I, when she said, he's gone, sir, she reached down and took my hand, tried to pull it off of him. And I kept holding on to him saying, no, Lord, I'm not accepting that he's dead. I'm asking you, Lord, to spare this one. And uh, America's been given an opportunity to get it right. We can't go back to what we've been doing. We can't keep conforming to this world. And we got to hold on. We got to grip tight and we got to pray. We got to pray from the depths of our heart. We've got to have special intercessory prayer. 
We got to come to church some Friday night or Wednesday night just to do nothing but pray for America. Tonight, if we finish in time, I'm getting on a prayer call with a guy out of Ohio, Frank Amedia, who's got a what he calls POTUS shield, and we're going to pray tonight because if we hold on, God will move mountains for us. See, in 2014. That doctor was chosen as the number one doctor in the Shenandoah Valley of Virginia. And I know what I saw. And I know what they said to me. They said, let him go. He's gone. We can't let America go because we still serve a miracle working God. Not because we deserve it, but because he's God. And there is no other. God bless you.